For those who, of you who may have missed it, I'm Elizabeth Allen. I'm the program assistant at Idaho Smart Growth. I am also the education and outreach chair for the American Planning Association Idaho chapter. Um, tonight, I'm very happy to introduce our presenter, Aaron Qualls. Aaron is a former planning director for the city of Sandpoint and former council member and planning and zoning commissioner. And he is currently a project manager at SCJ Alliance and is the president of APA Idaho. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Aaron. So we're gonna to talk tonight about uh, comprehensive planning versus zoning, what are the differences? It's been my experience that there, there's been a lot of confusion around the differences between a comprehensive plan and zoning by citizens and citizen planners. Um, so to start off, what you see uh, next to me are two different maps and they look very similar, uh, but they have different purposes. One is a future land use map and the other is a zoning map. And the real difference is that a uh, comprehensive plan land use map is a vision for the future where zoning is the implementation of that future. So I'm gonna, I wanna talk about, uh, uh, go into detail, uh, go into a little bit of detail about comprehensive plans, talk about zoning ordinances, and then talk about some specific examples of how a zoning ordinance um, re may resulted from a comprehensive comp plan goal and objective. And then I also wanna talk about uh, conditional use permits. It's my experience, that's where things really get interesting. Uh, particularly when, um, you know, the, uh, particularly around that confusion between uh, a comp plan versus zoning. So let's talk about comprehensive plans. If you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. One of my favorite quotes from Yogi Berra, uh, comprehensive plan is a long-term vision for a community. Uh, uh, every city and county is required to have a comprehensive plan. And there are 17 required elements. Uh, comprehensive plans uh, have a uh, vision, uh, goals and objectives. Uh, they contain a lot of data with existing conditions, trends, uh, analyze compatibility of land uses, have population forecasts, um, and are really intended to guide future land uses and development. It is a guidance document. Um, so it guides major decisions of like where and how the city may grow and sets the stage for what can be built where. Uh, it also helps, the idea is that it helps uh, that um, develop, it, it helps, uh, well, it helps provide a degree of predictability for property owners, businesses, and res residents. And the idea is that uh, development decisions are not made on the fly, but are made in the context of a broader community vision. So predictability, how, how do we predict the future? How do planners predict the future? Well. And every time a, uh, if someone graduates from planning school, they're given a crystal ball, of course, to predict the future. No, we're not really. Um, and that's why it's important, a good practice to update comprehensive plans every five to seven years. This is not a requirement in Idaho. It is in other states, but it's uh, generally a good practice. And as we know, in Idaho, um, I, I can tell you our forecasts uh, just recently are, have been blown out of the water. This is some recent data that uh, we uh, were incorporated into an existing conditions report for Sandpoint. And uh, it's already completely uh, useless, especially the, um, the housing data. But data is, is how we can try to forecast the future. And these are some typical um, demographic data, population forecast, housing information, educational attainment, uh, that go into a comp plan to try to inform uh, the future um, and try to inform our decisions about the future. You're not limited to just those elements. Um, what you see behind me here is a, uh, another type of analysis, um, a uh, taxable value by acre analysis that um, we were looking to incorporate in the Sandpoint Comprehensive Plan. And uh, what this shows is how much taxable value is per acre of development. And it's kind of an interesting metric uh, for cities as they consider this, the fiscal sustainability of different development types. And spoiler alert, the, uh, the type of development that smart growth principles um, try to encourage is much more fiscally sustainable than your um, more contemporary uh, sprawling type of development. Um, if you can see kind of, this is Sandpoint here. You kind of see the traditional downtown has a very high um, taxable value per acre versus some of the uh, out, outline more um, contemporary big box stores 
have a relatively low value per acre. And that's kind of an interesting metric because um, it's property taxes that really help it, that um, cities and, and counties, frankly, um, have to um, provide services to residents. So comprehensive plan is truly comprehensive. Uh, and these are the 17 elements. Um, not all these elements are required and it's important to incorporate all of them in a comprehensive plan, lest your comprehensive plan be, be challenged for some reason later on. Um, some of the biggest, you know, the ones that take a, a lot of the attention are housing, transportation, recreation, and of course the future land use map, which I'll talk about um, in a few moments. There are other components that you can also incorporate in the comp, comp plans. Uh, health, for example, arts and culture. Um, every health district is required to provide a community uh, um, health assessment, which is a wealth of data that can help uh, inform uh, trends and visions and goals and objectives uh, in a comprehensive plan, such as the, the amount of physical activity that residents currently um, uh, uh, do. And, you know, that, as we, we know in, in the planning world, that how you uh, lay out and develop a, a town through zoning and subdivision ordinances, it can really affect uh, people's ability or willingness to walk or bike to places. Arts and culture is another important aspect to a lot of communities who, uh, and uh, very important to local economies and to overall quality of life, of course, as well as historic preservation. So kind of stepping back and looking how a comprehensive plan is structured and how it kind of informs other plans, uh, it's really a tiered system, starting with a you know, broad-based community vision, then uh, goals, um, kind of an intent for the future, aspirations, and then policies that um, help to kind of implement those uh, goals and that vision. And this can lead to other sub area plans like a downtown plan, for example, parks and rec plan, historic preservation plan, but it all should be tied back to that tiered system, that vision, those goals and policies. So here's an example vision statement. Um, the city of blank, vibrant, prospering, nurturing a balance of innovation, tradition, fiscally sustainable, accepting, social diversity, small town character, natural setting. So from that, you start to, and this takes a lot of public engagement and comp plans can take a, a while to really, um, uh, to really develop because you, you want a comp plan that's not gonna sit on the shelf and that you're gonna be able to implement. So a plan is only as good as the public support it has behind it. So it's, an, it's really important to really pay attention to these vision goals and policies that comp plans have. So a goal versus a policy. A goal, a broad statement of intent that will fulfill a vision of what the city intends to become or how it may look or feel in the future. And then a policy is a specific statement that guides decision making in order to help realize that goal. Well, let's look at a couple of examples. So uh, here's an example goal. It was act is actually one of the smart growth principles, create a range of housing opportunities and choices. And what would be one policy in order to help attain that goal? Uh, and this is taken from a local community, uh, blend mixed densities in uh, neighborhoods to provide for income diversity among neighborhood residents while ensuring that the bulk mass and scale of any individual development does not dominate a street. So I'm gonna come back to that policy. I'm gonna give you a specific example of how a zoning uh, ordinance may implement it. So bear with me. Um, another really important component of a, um, of a, uh, a comp plan is the future land use map. Um, these, what it designates are intended uses and development density. It's not a zoning map, it's not regulations, but it guides subsequent zoning. Now it's not limited to just uses and development. You can also designate for certain land use areas, uh, going back to the um, question I heard before we got started here is, well, how can it relate to transportation? Your land use map and the, and the districts that it, that it um, talks about or the, the areas uh, can also inform different types of transportation options, uh, depending on the types of uses and the types of densities. So it is based on transportation and historic areas, natural resources, land use demand and balance, uh, and of course, public income. So 
you've got a comp plan, that's great. But how do you implement it? Um, and zoning is one tool to implement. Zoning and subdivision are probably primary regulatory tools for implementing a comprehensive plan. So where, whereas you have a land use, future land use map and policies in a comp plan, it's the zoning ordinance that really regulates on the ground and specifies what uses are permitted and where, um, and what uses are conditionally permitted. And I'll talk about conditional use permits or special permit, special use permits um, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so it can determine the dimensional standards, height, setbacks, uh, lot sizes, density standards. And per state law in Idaho, a zoning ordinance must be in accordance with the comp plan, a specific language. The historic purpose of a zoning ordinance is uh, to separate incompatible uses. And this uh, dates back all the way to uh, 1926, a landmark US Supreme Court case called Euclid versus Ambler Realty. And in that court case, um, the town of Euclid wanted to separate uses because there's a really intense industrial use close to residential. And the Supreme Court, court upheld that. A term you might hear planners refer to sometimes is called Euclidean, Euclidean zoning. And um, that comes from that court case. And um, in the planning world, we, we always look to history for unintended consequences. And Euclidean zoning taken to its extremes has led to the separation of a lot of uses, right? So residential over here, commercial over here, industrial back there, and that has, tended to create communities that are really uh, automotive dependent, right? Those, you know, separation of uses. So sometimes uses can be mixed and that's what, you know, a comp plan and a subsequent zoning ordinance can kind of help to address. So you want to match land use with infrastructure, um, going back to, you know, relating to transportation plans. And uh, for example, if there's a highway interchange, maybe a single family home is the highest and best use. Um, and there is a couple ways in which a zoning ordinance can be amended or adopted. One is by the community itself, by the city or county, uh, and the other is applicant driven. So while one is what's known as a legislative process, a uh, process that affects everybody, uh, for an applicant to go and apply for a zone change, that's a quasi judicial process. But in either case, um, the decision criteria is that it is in court in accordance with the policy of the comp plan, of the comp plan. and uh, the land use, future land use map should also be consulted. But the policies really have to align with um, any uh, zoning designation. Uh, delivery of services is also a consideration when uh, considering zoning ordinances. Can the site be served uh, through transportation, water, sewer, et cetera? And then any other evidence uh, through a hearing process. So let's look at zoning districts, a little different than the uh, future land use map. These are the regulations on the ground. They define um, the allowable uses and can contain the design and development standards for those intended uses. So on this map, you'll see a range of districts, you have residential, you have commercial, you have mixed use residential, industrial, and then what you're seeing over by the airport are what's called, known as overlay zones. And overlay zones, um, are additional standards uh, in addition to the uh, underlying zoning district. And very typical of airports to have uh, safety zones at the ends of run runways and you know, lateral safety zones next to the runway. Um, and then of course the holy ground of FAA, which is the runway protection zone. So they can have uh, additional requirements or standards in order to protect the viability of the airport and maintain safety. Um, there's other types of overlay zones, of course, historic district overlays, um, uh, et cetera. So I thought I'd throw this in. This gets more into the subdivision uh, implementation tool, uh, but I thought it's really relevant, particularly for Idaho, as we see tremendous growth pressures. And uh, what you see are two different scenarios. And subdivision ordinances really relate back to zoning ordinances. Zoning ordinances typically specify uh, lot dimensions, but subdivision standards uh, govern how the uh, streets are laid out and what types of public improvements may be needed to serve a site. 
So they relate together and they're both important implementation tools for a comprehensive plan. So, I, and I've been working on a couple of um, these types of, um, what you're seeing on the right is what's called a conservation subdivision versus the one on the left, which is more of a traditional uh, contemporary um, large lot single family home subdivision. And the difference isn't the number of units, it's the same number of units, but one preserves a lot more of the natural area versus the other. And that can have a lot of benefits. Uh, it can benefit, you know, in terms of habitat, quality of life, water quality, and even um, if designed properly, uh, mitigate the risk of wildfire. So um, uh, conservation subdivisions are one, you know, one kind of tool in the toolbox to handle growth without sacrificing quality of life and the, the scenic and recreational and um, natural areas that are you know, really important in Idaho. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's go back to our policy, blend mixed densities in neighborhoods to provide for income diversity among neighborhood residents, ensuring that bulk mass and scale of any individual development does not dominate a street. Okay, great, we have this in our comp plan, so everything's fine, right? Not so fast, we have to implement it. So how do we implement this policy? And one way is through a zoning standard. Um, here's one zoning standard that helps to implement that policy where you're accommodating, you're allowing a little bit more density, but there's design requirements so that it mixes in with the uh, existing you know, single story, single family um, residential area. So this is a particular standard, actually I took it from Coeur d'Alene and I like it because it's very specific and it has a, um, a nice visual to go along with it. So it requires a, a setback and then a pitch from that setback when you're adjacent to a single family story. So there's allowable density, but there's some design standards so that it doesn't dominate the street. You'll notice that I made a slight amendment myself to this where I crossed out the word should and put the word shall. Should is kind of a tricky word in ordinances. Um, so the, the clearer it is for, I can tell you as a planning director, uh, the better. It's, it gets a little bit um, scary when a planning director you know, gets to make too many judgment calls on his own. Clarity is always good. Um, another um, way to implement that policy uh, is through reduced setbacks and smaller lot sizes. This is a recent development in Sandpoint. It was based off of uh, an ordinance uh, designed to kind of handle a lot of substandard lot sizes we had in town. They're these narrow shotgun, 25 foot wide, uh, long lots that are all through town that used to serve trailer homes. Well, how do you uh, develop those in a way that, you know, maintains character and, and maybe incentivizes another mix of housing? Um, so I'm not putting all the standards here, but um, some of them, uh, some of the additional standards led to what you're seeing in the picture here. And reduce setbacks, three feet, so you can take a little bit more advantage. Uh, this is also served by an alley. So parking can be around back. Uh, mixing up the facades is a requirement. Staggering the front setback so that they're not all in one single line helps to kind of create that uh, variation on the street. And those are all specific zoning standards uh, designed to implement that comprehensive plan policy uh, that we talked about earlier. Okay, uh, let's talk about, let's do one more example. Uh, goal, make Sandpoint a walkable community. This is, uh, this is a specific goal in Sandpoint's existing comprehensive plan. Uh, and one of the policies, um, also a vision statement, is to develop parking requirements, you know, part of the vision for the comp plan, develop parking requirements that reduce the visual prominence of automobiles. Well, if we go to our zoning standard, we have one in our commercial areas that requires, or that or this allows parking to be between a building and a street. And this is another recent development that had to adhere to that standard. We see the building uh, fronts the sidewalk and the parking is around side, even with some additional screening. You can see kind of in the, um, let's see, where's my hand? Right there. <laughs> um, so this is the type of development that is um, not just encouraged, but required in the zoning code to implement that comprehensive plan policy. So what about conditional use permits? And this is where, in my experience, uh, citizens and even decision makers 
get really confused. So conditional use permits are special use permits um, that are specified in the zoning ordinance. Certain uses may require a special use permit. And they require public hearing and uh, neighbor notification. And the important thing is that they really focus on the how of implementation. And that's where a lot of I've seen a lot of confusion is, is whether it can be disallowed or not, right? Just based on opinion. Um, but really the intent is to mitigate adverse effects. So if there's a use or a type of development that's allowed by a conditional use permit in a specific zone, there should be ways in most cases to mitigate any adverse effects that um, the data would support and evidence would support through the public hearing process. Um, there's a little bit slightly different language for conditional use permits where they uh, must not be in conflict with the comprehensive plan. And a good zoning ordinance will specify the types of conditions that may be placed upon a development that's allowed by conditional use. Uh, for example, the timing of development or architectural detailing or screening, landscaping, uh, and that kind of thing. So conditional use permits, they're not a small deal because they typically run with the land. Um, now I've heard some competing uh, interpretations on this from, uh, from different lawyers. But uh, generally, if a conditional use permit is allowed, it's almost like a contracted, you know, contractual agreement in perpetuity. Um, but they usually, they usually or should, a, a good ordinance will have an expiration date so that it has to be acted on within a certain amount of time. Okay, this is, uh, uh, this was a specific conditional use permit that uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, that uh, was went to the Planning Commission and who approved it and neighbors appealed the decision and uh, ultimately went on appeal to City Council and City Council ultimately approved it as well. But this was a, a really good example of, of, to me of how there's a lot of confusion between you know, the difference between a comprehensive plan and the subsequent zoning ordinance. So the zoning ordinance allowed this development. And this is a 21 unit develop, uh, multifamily development that was allowed in a predominantly single family neighborhood. Now the zoning allowed that density and there were certain, you know, with certain standards, um, stepped height standards, which you can kind of see uh, from that, um, from that uh, policy we talked about earlier. Uh, as, uh, as well as, you know, architectural detailing, uh, wind, you know, a certain uh, amount of square footage of facade of windows, um, entryways oriented to the street, which isn't shown very well here and kind of blocking it. Um, but the question is, okay, and of course there was a trip generation distribution letter, you know, demonstrating that um, it wouldn't provide excessive amount of traffic that would trigger a traffic impact study, which could lead to, you know, other, um, other improvements, but of course, you know, a lot of neighbors were concerned about traffic uh, and parking, uh, which, you know, again, it provided an excess, you know, more than the minimum required parking uh, stalls to serve the site. Um, the site is also already served by two streets on either side, and it was uh, served by water and sewer. So it was an infill project uh, in accordance with you know, the policies of the comp comprehensive plan in order to provide additional housing types and met the zoning code. So is there a basis to um, deny this permit? Uh, and there was a lot of confusion by citizens around that. But really, it, you know, to the chagrin of, of certain, a lot of neighbors, just the opinion that they, you know, wouldn't want this here isn't really a basis for denying a conditional use permit. However, you can put reasonable conditions. Uh, so, and, and we did, we put uh, conditions regarding screening, additional trees, additional fencing. I think we actually required a masonry wall uh, in order to prohibit you know, lights from uh, parked vehicles, uh, trespassing into yards. Uh, we also required that th this block that it's on is an unusually long block. So we required that a pedestrian easement connect the blocks in order to provide more walkability to serve the subsequent development and the neighborhood. Uh, and that was adhered to. 
uh, lighting. We required, there's some really interesting data about um, color temperature and lighting, how it can negatively affect people's sleeping patterns and also negatively affect wildlife. Um, so we required a lower Kelvin lighting for the, uh, for the development. And um, you know, there's, a, there's also a dark sky ordinance, but it's, it doesn't have that Kelvin rating. So that was an additional requirement to put on this development. So those are the kinds of things that you can uh, require in a conditional use. Those, those are some examples, rather, uh, to help mitigate impacts of the development. Um, and uh, I know we've got some heavyweights probably with a lot of really tough questions. So uh, I will go ahead and open it up to questions. This is a small town of Shanico, and there's no particular reason why I have it in my background. <laughs> so far away. Awesome, thanks, Aaron. That was uh, a lot of information. I can tell that you really know your stuff. So um, I'm gonna give everybody a second to kind of get situated and see if any questions arise. Um, and if not, I will um, ask some uh, on my own. <laughs> Yeah, Aaron, I have a question. This is Sam Gallagher. Um, the, I'll turn my camera on here so you can see. Uh, the, the last part that you talked about was, is really fascinating. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any tips on um, if you're looking at a development and trying to compare it to the city's plans, if there are specific things that you look for to see, like, hey, does this mesh? Does it not mesh? Sounds like there's a lot of nuance <clears throat> with policies that say shall or should. and yeah, how do you how do you weigh all those factors? They're very complex. So it helps to have clear standards in a zoning ordinance, and you know the zone, zoning ordinance has to be in accordance with a comprehensive plan. But you know if if you're if you're stuck with a zoning ordinance that doesn't have clear standards, you're in a pickle. And you know in some cases, I guess if you know for a controversial project, right, or something that could go either way. Um, one, one thing that a planning director can always do is go to the planning commission for an interpretation. Now this development had to go before the planning commission and it really takes a, a lot of work, working with ahead of time, working with the developer, um, you know, and, and some things, you know, aren't hard required, but if, if they want, you know, you can just advise them on, um, other, you know, standards that might, or other detailing that might um, help with the overall project in its context of the neighborhood. Uh, but really, if they meet the standards, they meet the standards, right? Um, and then it, it, and then really listening to the community to see, okay, what are your concerns, and how do we mitigate those? And um, that's. That's what a, a planner does. There's a lot of work ahead of time uh, before a project like this goes to hearing. That, it, was a, it was a unique, certainly a, a unique project in respect of the amount of uh, public involvement. Thank you. Hi, Erin, this is Michelle. Hi, hey Michelle, how are you? I'm doing great. It's it's great to see you. Um, I have a question for you related to your CUP process um, that you used in Sandpoint. Do you have any examples of when um, your council actually denied a CUP because it didn't meet the criteria? No. Uh, I'm proud to say that I have not taken something, and and we, you know, our, our conditional use permits are uh, approved by planning uh, the, our planning commission. It doesn't have to be that way. I know in some cities, it can be advisory uh, to the city council, uh, but in our case, they, they act as the quasi-judicial body, the, the planning commission. And no, um, if uh, um, you know, a developer or a property owner, you know, we would, we would you know, evaluate it pretty, pretty well and let them know like we don't see how this 
and our staff report is going to reflect if we don't see that it meets the criteria, you know, and there shouldn't be, you know, in most cases, there should be ways to, um, there should be ways to offset impacts if it's, if in the zoning ordinance, it is allowed by conditional use. Now, what I don't think I did talk about is that you, it's, it's really tricky to deny one. You really have to have good findings, I think, in most cases. Um, not that it's impossible, uh, but you can't, what, what some communities I know have tried to do is rather than just straight up deny it, they have uh, placed like extremely onerous conditions, like a helicopter pad, for example, something that there wasn't really a nexus to, or wasn't roughly proportional to the, to offset the impacts of the development. So, but the short answer is no, I haven't seen one actually denied while I was at Sandpoint. Okay, thanks. Hey there, this is Rachel Grosso. Um, my question for, I have a few questions, but I'll start with one. Um, do you, or is it recommended, or is it common practice that a zoning ordinance is updated as regularly as a comprehensive plan is to continue reflecting that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important to be able to, and you know, there's there's always unintended consequences, right? Or a this this could have been more clear. I'm making too many interpretations. That's not good practice. Um, so yes, I think zoning ordinances should be reviewed regularly, at least for you know clarity purposes. Um, but you know it really has to be in accordance with the comp plan. So uh, except for just, you know, clarifications um, where, you know, zone ordinance could be made more clear or there's, you know, language that could be, could be interpreted differently. Um, if, if it's really substantive changes, then you really need to go back and take a look at the comp plan and, and make sure it's in, in accordance, but absolutely. And then following up on that and coming from the transportation side, I'm aware of some jurisdictions that have tried to contextualize their land use and zoning to better reflect the street network that they mm -hmm. are working with or like the ones that they want to work with. And do you have any experience with that? What are your thoughts on it? Um, mm -hmm. I'm specifically thinking about the city of Portland context tool right now because I recently read about it, but like smaller scale examples or anything else I'm, I'm interested in? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, you know, I meant to, and I sort of it kind of fell off my radar, but there, there are some really good examples of, in the land use map, um, they can be referred to as like context areas. You know, they're not zoning, it's like, this is what it could look and feel like. And I think it's a really good practice to incorporate different types of, you know, street network standards for that. And what types of transportation may serve this area, right? Is it in a multifamily zone? Maybe it's geared towards transit, biking, and you know, uh, appropriate street network. Uh, and you can specify that in your context area. So that's that's really where I think in a comp plan transportation. I mean, there has to be a whole transportation component, right? But I think in terms of the context area, they they really have to be looked at together. So yes, I I think it is a, a really good practice. Cool. I guess my last question for you would be in maybe even just the past 10 years that location-based services have really emerged as something that has taken like has changed everything right like google maps changed everything in my humble opinion yeah. and so i'm curious to hear your thoughts on how either place-based location-based technologies or just other emerging technologies are are or should affect both the comprehensive planning and zoning processes all right, that is a great question. That's a big question. <laughs> one, of the, one of my favorite quotes that I recently heard was, uh, today is the slowest rate of change we'll ever see, All right? So, I mean, the way, the way technology is evolving, I mean, 10 years ago, I don't think we even had, you know, smartphones, right? We didn't have Uber, we didn't have um, Airbnb. And it's, gosh, it's so important for, cities to be able to, 
cities and counties and you know any local decision makers to be able to really get a, try to get ahead and address those things and be nimble in, in addressing those things. Um, so regarding like like you mentioned like Google Maps and it is kind of it is really interesting how that in itself can affect uh, transportation patterns, right? Um, and there are ways that cities and counties can actually influence that um, beyond just trying to slow traffic down so that people's maps automatically take them to a faster route in the way they want to. Um, I don't have experience with that, but I know there's a way that you can work with Google as a local government to, you know, if, for example, a lot of people are cutting through an area in a, a residential neighborhood that's causing issues, um, there is a process through like Google. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy to think about in a, in a, in a sense that we're at the, the mercy of, of a company to, you know, not even a local company to, <laughs> that influences our transportation patterns, but boy, the, the technology, the rapid increase of it is just a, a real challenge. And, you know, one of the things I, I've been working on a trails plan for another community, micro mobility is one, is another one where, you know, in 10 years from now, how many people are going to be on, you know, uh, one wheels or scooters or, you know, electric bikes, pedal assist bikes. How do you, how do you separate those uses? How, how, do, you, how do you make them safe? Um, and what kind of networks do we need to accommodate going forward? It's, it's an exciting time to be, you know, working in planning. It's also sometimes overwhelming because of, like you say, those technological, those exponential technical, technological um, uh, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> cool, thank you. Sure. Any other question? I see some uh, some chat activity. I'll jump in while um, folks are thinking if they have other questions. Um, so I was intrigued by the um, the CUP SUP stuff because I know that's something that happens a lot um, mm -hmm. uh, where neighbors and neighborhoods engage in that process. Mm -hmm. Um, by being informed and whatnot, um, that, that something's happening in their, in their proximity. Um, so you mentioned that a good, um, now, is that, that's zoning, right? When we're talking CUP and, and... Well, yeah, so a zoning ordinance will specify allowed uses, prohibited uses, also, well, any use not specifically mentioned is not allowed. Um, there's, uh, so that's something to be aware of. Um, we didn't talk about form-based codes, which is a, uh, also a really great, you know, where you, you're not too specific on uses, more about the form of the built environment. Um, but um, so a conditional use permit is, is the other type of use. There's allowed uses, non-allowed uses, and then conditionally allowed uses, right? And that's where a lot of confusion happens. And so um, I see Elizabeth here work for a city where they had a CP denied, despite the fact that it met all the requirements. And that certainly happens. Um, but the risk is, you know, that you could suffer litigation from the property owner, right? Property owner bought this property with the zoning in place saying the density is this, uh, the height requirements are this, setbacks are this. I invested in this property and now, you know, you're not giving, there's not an evidence-based decision to deny it. It's, it's more based on opinion. APA National uh, American Planning Association has a really good, um, they have these PAS reports, Planning Advisory Service reports, and they have, uh, I want to say, they have one on, on conditional use, use permits specifically. It's, it's worth a read for any practicing planners out there. So uh, answer the question or did I get off course there? No, that was sort of a lead up question. My real true question, I, I wanted to make sure I understood where CUP and SUP comes from. Um, but my real question is, so if I understood you right, you said if, if it's written correctly, and that's why I was asking about whether this is planning or, or comprehensive planning, 
um, or zoning, sorry. Um, if it's written correctly, it's going to specifically um, clearly lay out what those allowable conditions are. Did I understand well, that correct? Well, it's going to give you the types of a good, I, I think I said a good ordinance, a good zoning ordinance, which um, states that certain uses are, are allowed by CUP. It would specify somewhere in the development code, the process and the types of conditions um, that, uh, but not, you're not going to be able to come up with every condition for every project in, a, in an ordinance, but, you know, is it to mitigate you know, adverse impacts such as noise, glare, traffic, parking. Uh, is it, you know, architectural? Um, is it, um, you know, timing of, of development? It's, it's, a, it's just good practice in a zoning ordinance to kind of specify the types of conditions. So what, what level then do the, um do the planners have in determining um, when and how to um, condition a particular mm -hmm. application? So it's the staff report that, so for a conditional use permit, it's a public hearing process, right? And it goes before a planning commission or a city council or board of county commissioners for approval. They're the decision makers, right? Uh, but the a practicing planner, uh, well, you know, ideally have a very detailed staff report and we'll have required uh, enough information from the applicant. The burden is really on the applicant to make their case, right? But it's, it's the duty of a practicing planner to uh, provide some conditions for consideration, right? Um, we, we see that, you know, uh, there could be lighting trespass. So um, we're going to require a more of a, a wall here, you know, to prevent the headlights from, you know, going through fence boards or the character of the neighborhood really doesn't, you know, a vinyl fence that the developer wants to do isn't really, you know, going to meet the character. So we'd recommend conditioning it to be, you know, a wooden fence or a masonry fence uh, and as an example and, you know, additional trees may be planted for additional screening um, uh, or, you know, Based on a preliminary stormwater plan, we may require additional stormwater um, treatment swells. Um, and in the case of, you know, that one I showed, we, we asked for, an, that's a pretty big ask. We asked for them to dedicate public easement across the property, right? In order to, because we could demonstrate that, well, this block length isn't really, um, isn't really in line with our current code. And so we'd at least like a pedestrian connection through there. So it's really it has to be evidence based, and you have to be able to support it. Uh, but it's ultimately up to the decision makers, and they can come up with, with other conditions. You know, once you go to public hearing, you, there may be new evidence presented that uh, brings other issues to light, and they can put additional conditions and for a co commercial use. It might be timing of operation, right, um, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think my my reason for being curious about that is I I um I know I, I think it was when I was talking to Deanna about this. Um, you know, when when a neighborhood gets engaged in a process, um, you know, like that example you gave, so good, such a good example. Um, what I think of is the neighborhood um, would go, okay, we don't want that, right? Um, for whatever reason, whatever reason they want to give. Um, but um, they never know what lingo to use or what things to ask for to try and, like you said, the, the word you use, mitigate, to mitigate some of those impacts that they're going to see, um, you know, just knowing what even tools to use or what to ask for, like how many um, citizens are going to know that they could ask for having, um, you know, a cut through pathway. That's a really cool thing to have and ask for. Mm -hmm. um, so is there, is there a place that, um, that offers like some, some examples or ideas of what some of those mitigation conditional uses, or is that just the, the burden lies on the city planners to, to come up with those? Well, uh, I mean, typically it, the, the, again, again, those things are kind of, hopefully a planner does a good job of evaluating everything and suggesting conditions. And showing up to the hearing may 
bring light other conditions that the planning commission or uh, other decision-making body may require. Um, I think, you know, what's unfortunate is that rather than trying to, in my experience, in, in certain situations, rather than trying to find uh, ways to mitigate it, people just want to stop it, right? And, you know, if, if a project meets, you know, the, the dimensional and, and, you know, density standards, et cetera, it's, it's just not a great strategy to try and stop it, but it's, you know, well, how can we make it better? You know, how can we mitigate some of these impacts? And that's, in most cases, a better conversation to have. And uh, sometimes that just takes planners working with neighbors. You know, the, the plan, as a planner, you, it, it's, it's, not, it's not our job to sell the project. That's the applicant's job. It's our job to listen to everybody and, you know, try to appease everybody, which I like to say is, you know, when, when nobody's happy at the end of the day, you've done your job because you've appeased everybody, <laughs> right? I think Deanna has a question. Yeah, I was waiting for you guys to get through that. Um, so Aaron, you mentioned form-based code really briefly and what you've mostly talked about tonight is Euclidean zoning. And I'm, I'm kind of one of those people who believes that even when really well done, Euclidean zoning is fairly problematic and sets, sets up communities for challenges. Mm -hmm. um, so would you um, talk a little more about form-based code and, and how it's different and um, the ideas behind it? Yeah, um, I'll try to. And I know at Idaho Smart Growth, um, you know, that's, I know that's something that really is a way to implement smart growth principles, right? So the idea is not to regulate you so much, but to reg uh, regulate the, the form of, of the built environment. So an, ex an example is, um, well, it, the parking standard, you know, we, in our commercial zones, we allow all kinds of uses and, and Euclidean zoning really started when, the, you know, industrial uses were pretty intense a lot of the time, right? There's a lot more even commercial uses, and it was really a legitimate health hazard. Um, and when people started fleeing cities, you know, back at the turn of the century, it was because the air was full of soot from coal, and, and you know, uh, you know, it was just cities were not a place you wanted to be <laughs> for a lot of people, right? Um, but that has really changed, and, and um, we haven't always caught up with that, right? Um, so that separation of uses, um, you know, it has, it's ca it has caused a lot of unintended consequences in, in the modern age. Um, so form-based codes, um, oriented buildings to the streets, window requirements, uh, but allowing a variety of uses where people can live and work in the same building, the same block, right? Um, and then you know, regulating things to ensure that the character, the historic character, traditional development pattern. If you think about how we used to build cities, it wasn't because of a, a, a you know, clever um, zoning or planning director. It wasn't because of zoning code, it's because that's how people built cities for thousands of years, right? They, um, they lived close to where they were. They lived upstairs from where they were. Um, and they built them for people, right? Because it wasn't this huge, infrastructure and there wasn't the automotive um the automobile to take people you know uh, vast distances so and if you look at the most successful places they're they're often the most successful economically and fiscally the most exciting places to be in you know urban environments it's typically places like you see behind me which is you know um your, your traditional uh you know, type of development that's built for people. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't come prepared to talk a whole lot about form-based codes, but that's, that's kind of the general principle. And, and if anybody else wants to jump in about that, please feel free. Hey, Lane. Talk much about, um, and maybe, maybe you're a good enough planner that this never happened to you about finding inconsistencies between the comprehensive plan and the zone or between the comprehensive plan and, and um, 
other plans that may have been on the books either before, typically before in the ones I've seen, uh, the yeah. comprehensive plan was adopted. And as a result of those inconsistencies, maybe a request for a long regional use permit and um, kinds of things that, that one should or can consider when those kinds of inconsistencies creep into the decision that's before you. It's a good question, another big one. Um, so there's, there's two things that come to mind. Uh, inconsistencies in population forecasts, right? So the comp plan may have a population forecast, but then this other wastewater treatment plan, you know, that's going to determine whether we need to, um, you know, upgrade an existing facility or relocate it may have a different population forecast. And that's really problematic because those are big decisions um, that have a lot, huge costs associated with them. Um, the other one is in transportation. So we have a comprehensive plan. The Sandpoint has had a comprehensive plan. I'll tell you that has a very different vision for transportation than the urban area transportation plan. I mean, that's a real conflict. And when it comes down to a, you know, a, a subdivision coming through, um, there's, there's some real competing visions there that uh, are difficult to resolve. Um, so I think looking at your plans often and making sure they align, ideally, ideally you start with the comp plan, right? And then the other master plan should follow that. That should be, you know, that tiered system I talked about where, you know, the vision, the goals, the policies, those should influence all those other sub plans. Uh, but yeah, when a, you're honestly, and I've been in it, a pickle where, you know, you've got the comp plan with a vision that has maybe more of a direction towards multimodal transportation, whereas, you know, our, our urban area transportation plan, which is a broader, which is covers a broader area, is much more auto centric, right? And, and when you're uh, bringing a subdivision before the planning commission, it's, it's a real uncomfortable spot when you, um, uh, when you, when you have those co co competing visions and policies, and uh, it's not a very nice it's it's a hard place hard place to sit um i'll tell you so i think it's really important and i would say start with the comp plan and make sure your plans align with it and if you need to update your comp plan then that's you know maybe what it should take did i answer your question elaine yeah thank you it did it's it's a tough question like you said yeah yeah well um Thank you so much, Aaron, for sharing your time and talents um, and knowledge with all of us. Um, before everyone sort of signs off, let me just give a last couple of notes. Um, so the series, the Citizens Planning Academy series is meant to be um, contiguous. So we hope that you will join us again next month. Um, it's the first Wednesday of May. Um, and we will be diving into um, area of impact and annexation. That's our next topic. So thanks again, Erin, for um, taking the time. And thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight.